combine a colorful artist, an award-winning illustrator, and an author, and you have Cynthia St. James. She has illustrated 17 books and is the author of Living My Dream, two poetry books, and a cookbook. Cynthia is the designer of the first Kwanzaa stamp for the United States Postal Service. Our featured speaker on this episode of Pause for Purpose, is world-renowned multicultural visual artist, Cynthia St. James. So today we are very pleased to welcome Cynthia St. James, who's joining us today uh, from Los Angeles, California. Most of us have had an opportunity to read about her work through the decades in the art world, including creator of the first Kwanzaa stamp, recipient of the Trumpet Award, an honorary doctorate of letter speaking engagements to new, too numerous to mention, and master classes throughout higher education institutes across the country. She is, I, I mean, just in a preliminary conversation we had, we learned that Cynthia was, besides an artist, was in the tax business, an accountant, acting, and Southern Living and recording company. I mean, she's been everywhere and is now living her passion, um, proudly uh, creating masterpieces and, and paintings that are sold worldwide. So with that, I'm gonna be just say thank you, Cynthia, for joining us. That's Cynthia with an S. And <laughs> I will uh, allow you to um, ask, uh, start the questions. Okay, well, we're thrilled to have you, Cynthia. And as Vicki just said, we've just been fascinated the last half hour getting filled in on all your other lives. <laughs> right. you, got, you guys, you gals know so much about me already just from our little conversation pre show. <laughs> so we want to now go back to the beginning and uh, and because uh, you are not a native Californian, right? So you you actually so go, go back to the early years and tell us where you started and how this all began. Well, I'll say this first. I'm disappointed that that I am a native Californian because I thought I was born in New York. I did, I, but I was, the first time I was in New York, I was two, but my mom and dad were both born and raised New Yorkers. So um, that's where everything started for me, including um, knowing at five that I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. And it wasn't, you know, it's not quite the same, although I think that we should always listen to what children say, because they're speaking what they feel before they're taught out of what they're really, what they'd love to do. So I'd say, listen to those kids. But I, I knew it felt like more on a serious level. It was not me just saying it to be, make some, please somebody or to make up something I wanted to be. Um, and it ended up being that. It ended up being the true passion in my entire life. Yeah. So we're talking like way back, like at age what? Five, in the Bronx, New York, five years old. That's what I was t already telling people that that's what I wanted. Uh, I, the irony is that throughout my life um, in all my school and even in my college education, I never had art. I never took art. I mean, um, I'm completely self-taught, um, basically, in the 60s, mid 60s, my parents, of course, felt that it'd be better prepared to be something else rather than an artist, because who was going to make a living at being an artist, you know? Um, but I'm glad it happened that way, because I'm not influenced by any grades that a teacher gave me in correctness of what art should be. It all just comes from my heart. Okay, so time goes on and you're in school. Are you going back and forth now between New York and California? And did those creative urges, I assume, build into a style during that time? Or how did, how did your style and that creativity, how did it evolve? Okay, let me uh, say this. Um, from two to six, I lived in New York and 18 to 23. I call that the wonder years of growth. Okay, remember Wonder Bread? <laughs> anyway, Wonder Years of Growth. That's my Wonder Years of Growth. 
So uh, I learned all the first things living in New York. Um, I sold my first painting in New York when I was 20. Um, so I fulfilled the fact that I was became professional, although I've had at least a dozen plus other jobs throughout my life, but I never stopped painting and I never, uh, I continue to sell my art through that, through that period. As far as my style goes, because I'm self-taught, I learned on my own and with some pointers from other artists, uh, for instance, New York in the 60s, when I sold my first painting, I was 1969. So that particular style was uh, abstract was the craze. So I did a lot of abstract paintings, plus still lives and landscapes. Um, then I just kept challenging myself. I learned uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, very early 80s, I was painting commission paintings of children realistically, where their eyes would follow you everywhere you went, including uh, painting wild and domestic animals that were uh, invited for a show that I participated in in France and Paris in 1980. Those are my wild and domestic animals, okay? Then more landscapes, seascapes, and then eventually I started adding people and in 1984, from a trip to Martinique, I developed a style of painting people without features. I call it featureless, but you feel their culture, you feel their mood, you feel their age, it's with, through the body language. And that's what I'm more known for now is the featureless paintings, but that didn't begin until 1984. So is that around the same time that you started to do classes in colleges? Because you've you've been all over the country and have done so many of the of the master classes, and or was that a, is that later? That came later. I was uh, very reluctant uh, for quite some time to go out and speak, and I never really thought that that I wanted to teach art. And primarily, I. I done it in a different way. Um, I've done classes and in, in, even in artists and residencies where I've taught the business of art. You know, everything from promotion to handling your taxes to anything that an artist would need to know that they don't get in school. That it's not, the business of art is not taught generally in most colleges or universities. Um, and I, I think I was there for me more to bring out when I did help in some classes, I taught um, painting and illustrating, no, I'm sorry, writing and illustrating children's picture books because I had done so many. Um, so I, I could share that information. But yeah. when I had a class, when I had the classes where that I was, the, that the students were actually painting, they were painting the way they wanted to paint. I was just there if they had questions. I never wanted to hinder, only to encourage. Okay, so talk about that whole period because you you obviously were so involved in many books. And uh, so talk about just how, how that happened and how it evolved. Um, for me, it seems like for most things come up because a seed has been planted. So I'll put it this way, when, I, when Terry McMillan asked to use a painting that I already had painted for her book cover, Waiting to Exhale, Penguin Pugman decided that to ask me, was I, had I ever been interested in painting, doing paintings or illustrating children's picture books? And I hadn't, but they gave me, they were the first to come to me with the opportunity. And the reason why is because they were attracted to my bright colors. So then the book started. So in the first year I had three contracts for, for books with major book publishers. And <laughs> what, what I didn't realize is that when you uh, actually, you're the co-author, you don't sit with the author. And then some of them I wrote and painted myself totally from um, Albert Whitman's company and you know things like that happened. Even for little Simon, Simon Schuster, I actually wrote as well. 
But in the beginning, I didn't realize that a children's picture book is going to be anywhere from 18 to sometimes 30 paintings. So in the first year, um, excited and learning as I went along, I actually was under contract to do three children's books in one year. I never made that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what it would it entail, but but so then I would get contracts, but they would have it in advance that I would get a contract in an advance to do a children's book, but I didn't have to begin it until the following year or it wasn't due until a year and a half from the contract date. So walk us through that. When you said you, you didn't realize all it entailed, what, what does it entail? If someone says, we want you to be part of this book. Well, well basically what happens that um, I didn't know, most people don't know, is that the book company is going to decide that there's this book and they're going to be under contract with the author first. Then the author has nothing to do with who's going to be the actual painter or illustrator. So in an entirely separate contract, you're sent a manuscript. And my favorite um, editor, his name was Richard Jackson said, do you see pictures after reading the book? Could I visualize? That's why I'm saying it's co-authoring. Um, and I could. And from then on, I always thought of it that way. So you're actually submitted a manuscript. Unless a, a book publisher goes, comes to you and say, I would love for you to write the book and also create the, the paintings. Okay, so yeah. what comes next in the chronology of, of your just growth evolution? Classes around the country? Uh, oh, okay. Well, well, yeah, uh, I believe, let me try to think about that. Remember, I was very reluctant about that in the beginning. Then I, I found out that once I got on a stage to speak, that I was fine because I felt the people in the audience's energy being lifted up and engaged. Uh, good example, I'll give you a good example. Uh, some years back uh, in the 90s, um, I was commissioned to do a painting for a, a bar association, a group of about 500 attorneys uh, commissioned me to do a piece for their annual conference. And um, at that point, I didn't even realize that I would have to go on a stage and they expected me to have to talk, okay? And so we got on the stage and the lawyers, you know, they're talk, 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 so you don't have to really worry. And one of the attorneys looked at me and said, would you like to say anything? And I always like to say, guess what I said? I pretended I had laryngitis. <laughs> <laughs> so for the rest of that event, so the rest of that event, I couldn't talk because I had already said that I had laryngitis. Okay. So I've, I've grown from that, and that must have been in the 80s. I've grown from that to feeling very comfortable in, in front of I don't care how many people, uh, because I just, I don't worry myself with it. I don't write a bunch of notes. I don't read from a script. I just am there for them, and I found out that that's my best way to work. Uh, so eventually I was at colleges. Believe me, I was amazed. My mom couldn't believe it. She was so happy because here was her daughter teaching college and, and university, but didn't have a degree in what she was teaching. <laughs> okay, because I had learned from my life all of these things that were practical knowledge, much more important than book learn knowledge. And I was able to share what I had learned and come from my heart with the students. And then a complete amazement when in 2010, I received three large uh, honors. One of them was a, a life, what was it? Lifetime Achievement kind of award 
but it's more like being inducted into the Hall of Fame for a women business owners organization that's national. And I was the one inducted into the Hall of Fame. It was like, that was really like, okay, now I'm in the Hall of Fame. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because I'm a business owner, but I'm I'm not a rich business owner. I just handle my businesses. It, the, when I had my tax business and my art business, so business owner. And it was just amazing to me. Uh, the other one was the Trumpet Award. Yeah, which, is televised, the, which is televised, which is televised in over 18 countries around the world. Zanona Clayton, who just recently turned 90, is the person who started it. And she was the first female and woman of color, black woman in Atlanta to have a TV program, you know, variety show. She worked with uh, Ted Turner and all. So she started the Trumpet Award. Now, the Trumpet Award primarily is people from all walks of life that in some way have given back to the community and in the, in the, actually in civil rights. Because anyone from Desmond Tutu to Lena Horn to Mandela, I mean, all of these people are the kinds of people that have received this honor. And for me to achieve that honor, was quite amazing. Company. It was quite amazing to me. And I was actually the first painter and to date the only painter, you know, but she saw something in me and what I was doing and what I was giving back, you know, and what I was doing for all people, you know, multicultural, the multicultural world. So uh, that was just another quite amazing thing. So those three things happen all within months of each other and at the beginning of 2010. Where was the Trumpet Award given? Or how, how did that take place? That's take, that takes place in Atlanta, Georgia, so uh, in, a, in an auditorium that there's, which is always filled to capacity over four to, between four and 5,000 people attend that event. Wow. So when you get up on the stage, you're looking at all of those people. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's and people are waiting and hoping that they can get in because there's a list of people that are invited. It's very I mean, you actually receive an invitation in the mail to come. It's not anything that anybody can buy a ticket and go to. Yeah, okay. it's very. Yeah. And Zenona Clayton, you know, it was her production. And uh, yeah, quite an amazing woman. That's exciting. So now, how does J.C. Penny factor into this whole scene? <laughs> You're speaking. Well, what, what I what I teach. Okay, what I teach. What I love teaching in my in, in my book. Uh, one of my books is called "Living My Dream: An Artistic Approach to Marketing." The follow up book is "Living My Dream: The 50th Anniversary Celebration." That's the one that's currently like on Amazon or whatever. But um, this licensing is so important to artists to be able to be able to utilize that as, as income. Um, so one of the things that I always teach students is don't give up your copyright because when you give up your copyright, it's a work for hire so you don't own it. So you can't license the painting, okay? So a lot of my money has come from licensing. And I, there's two things I wanted, wanted to mention. Um, I'll first do the JCPenney, but in August, uh, the vice president of creative for East Coast Graphics got in touch with me. And she sent me a wonderful email. She found me on Fine Art America because I put my work up on several sites. So it's always seen internationally. And she wanted to license, uh, actually have a licensing agreement that their company could offer my art to retail stores. Okay, so the the first was um, Home Sense, then Target. Um, oh God, World Market. Uh, there's some TJ Maxx. There's some Marshalls. There's a lot. And then what came up in uh, January, starting in January, 
was J.C. Penney's. So they get it. So what that means is that what it simply means, East Coast Graphics pays me a royalty on their sales to the stores. So let's say if they sold a, a piece to them for a hundred dollars, my royalty is ten percent. So I get ten. Okay. So I call it my it's when a a book author has their book first out, it's in hardback, correct? And then when it really is the hit, it goes mass market and it's in paperback. So I liken JC Penny and Target and HomeSense and TJ Max and all to my mass market. So the pieces aren't signed and numbered. They're not limited edition, they're open edition and at extremely affordable prices, extremely affordable. Okay. I, so that's I, also, I'm sorry, Joyce, I, that's also the, what I also tell the students and I, myself is called making money while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the I like it. Kind. <laughs> It's the best kind. I just saw a message in the chat room. We're going to continue the conversation, but Gary has to get to a 3.30 meeting. And whoops, I, Gary, you're, you're not there. Okay, <laughs> I, I think he left. Okay, I, I knew he wanted to. He said he's, he'll be in touch with you. Uh, is it okay? I put your, uh, your, your email addresses up there. Is it okay if, if folks get in touch with you? Oh, that's fine. That's okay, fine. fine. Uh -huh. so, so now th this is wonderful, but now we want to talk about your work. Um, okay. you know, some of it is right behind her, so you can get a flavor for the just the colors that she used and just the dynamism of your colors is so exciting. But also talk about what what you have right behind you that we can all see, which is called okay. a work in progress. Well, let me just give you a little idea. Well, first of all, I'm I I don't like labels, but when I'm closest to, if I call what I call myself is a multicultural artist, because I'm drawn to cultures of the world. Okay, and and so therefore, a lot of times I'm painting or creating something of a place I've been to, but oftentimes I haven't been there, but I'm learning something about the country, about the culture and about the people. So behind me, um, I'm going like, when I look like this, I'm going like, you know, the hand goes the other side, you know how that goes when you're looking. <laughs> okay, so if you're over here, okay, the painting behind me there is from my Haitian series. I did a, a, a whole series on Haiti. I've never been, but my mother's father was Haitian. Okay. So part of my multicultural thing comes in because of the different mixtures in my family. And so it's African, Haitian, here's the a Cherokee and here's the big one. My father's mother was Cherokee and German Jew. Wow. So, so there's nothing, I mean, what, I mean, there's so much stuff, you know, that can, that can come out of, me and what I'm drawn to, because I, I've done some pieces, my favorite Hasidic Jewish piece is called Prayer Shul. And I was just really drawn to the men going to synagogue and how the prayer shawls move as they're walking. And it's almost like a, it's almost like dance to look at that. It's almost like a very spiritual, but, but almost like a, an incredible costume with so much um, feeling and meaning to it. So, so behind me, so, so Haiti, we understand that Haitian grandfather, but also behind me, I've done series on Tibet, haven't been to Tibet, but uh, directly over my head is a piece of, of Tibetan monks, and it's called the Sham Dancer, and it's the monks in procession to go to a performance that only the dance, dances that the monks can do, that they learn since their beginnings. And what I'm working on now, I'm doing a series on the, um, well, it's East Indian, uh, sometimes called Hindu religion, but Diwali, the celebration of Diwali is, doesn't have any religious basis. People of all walks of life celebrate it 
from the Muslims to Sikhs, whatever, they all celebrate it because it's about good triumphing over evil or lightness over darkness, you know? So it's, that's why I was drawn to it. So I'm on my fourth painting in that series and you see just the top of that painting behind me, all those bright colors and windows. Um, I've created a piece in Diwali from in India, one uh, from uh, their goddess of, uh, yeah, of love and prosperity. I've done a piece on her, the Rangoli, that designs that they do. And I recently finished a piece on the celebration of Diwali in Trinidad. And now this one is uh, actually in Singapore. Uh, what I have yet to go is I've been to Guyana and Fiji and they have a very high population <laughs> Indian. So though that holiday is celebrated widely there. It's a festival that's at least five days, sometimes a month. And the one that's a work in progress. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one in Singapore. Oh, that that is the Singapore one. Yeah, that's a yeah. that is that's a that's a particular building that I fell in love with. It was a it, it was a villa uh, many many years ago. Chinese family that evidently was extremely rich because it's a villa. All right. So in those days, it was just painted white. But since that area in Singapore has become Little India, it's colored that brightly. And that's what drew me to it was the colors. So when and, you're working, are you working from the top down? Always? No, sometimes I'm in the middle, sometimes at the bottom, sometimes it's to the side. No, it's just whatever hits me. And I, I knew that I needed to get this building since it was going to be in the background. Because in the front, there's going to be people at the lower half. There are going to be people there. Um, I knew with that intricacy, I needed to get that perspective right and I needed to start there. Plus that's the part that attracted me the most. <laughs> that building definitely attracted me. Can I ask a question, Cynthia? Sure. Um, where in Singapore is the painting? Is it privately owned or is it in the museum? Oh, this no, the one I'm working on now? Yeah. Oh, this one is just me. Just, see, okay. Yeah, You're see what working. I... You, you know what I do? I get um, excited uh, by, I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly researching. So in, in looking at this holiday and all the places, I'm going like, well, I've been to a few of the places. I've been in Trinidad, Tobago. I've, I've been in Fiji. I've been in Guyana. I always wanted to go to Singapore. Just didn't want to take 23 hours to get someplace. So... <laughs> So I decided to, to show that representation. And then I found this building, this villa, and fell in love with the building and said, well, no, I got to do that first. We lived 11 years in Singapore and there's an a area, another area that if you ever go there or you, know, you can just Google it called Emerald Hill. Oh, I'll look it up right after we get off. Lots <laughs> of color. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, there was uh, Piranacon, are people in Singapore who settled in Malaysia and Singapore that were Chinese men married into Malay, uh, mm -hmm. married Malay women, and they had kind of their own culture. Okay. And that's in Emerald Hill. I think you'd love it. It's so cool. No, I, I would. I would because I remember, uh, oh God, it was, it was like in the early 80s when I first really wanted to go to Singapore. And I've just, this ever happened, you know, I mean, I've, I know it'll, it's a lot about how long it takes and to travel yeah. and to do it. You know, just like my other favorite place is Tahiti. Well, I've been there six times, but it, from oh. here, it's only eight and a half hours, you know, and, and it's a nonstop trip, right? So that's my other place, the island of Morea. Uh, but for me, Singapore is always like, you know, but I'm gonna look up Definitely. And, yeah. the, and the, other, the other thing that's that's really important to, to me and my and my technique or my process is I because I love the brightness and the colors so much, yeah. I paint coats of paint anywhere from six to sometimes ten coats of paint. So when you're looking at these paintings, the one I'm working on now, there's not even 
two coats except in a couple of little areas. But I'm going to keep going in and going in and going in and adding coats of paint to each color. Cynthia, I want to go back to um, you told us as we were before everyone joined um, that you worked um, for a New York uh, mortgage insurance company right across from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And Daniel Fishman wanted to uh, purchase one of your paintings, but in order to purchase one of your paintings, he first had to see what your paintings looked like. So you brought them in, correct? Oh, no, no, no. This is, he, he was a leap of faith. Oh. Daniel, Daniel Fishman commissioned me to do a painting for his apartment because he noticed that on payday, I was always going to an art, nearby art store and bringing it back to my job so I could get back on the, on the you know, on the L subway to the L to get back up to 224th Street in the Bronx. So, so I'd have all kinds of art supplies and that's what he noticed. So he, no pictures, he never saw anything. It was a act of faith. Mm -hmm. And when I bought it in, as I mentioned, my coworkers fell in love with it, but, and he beat them to the punch. He commissioned me to do a second piece. So I wanna go back to like, all the things you did before you became an artist, before you became an official artist, because you were worked with a recording company, you were in a tech right. company, mm -hmm. you were uh, an accountant, uh, you did payroll for three companies, right? Well, you know, I can tell you what I did. Okay. I, I, okay. Um, in New York at a security title and guarantee company, I was an accounts receivable clerk. Okay, then I worked briefly for Phoenix House and I did payroll. Then I moved to uh, Los Angeles. And um, in Los Angeles, my first job before I got a job was I worked for account temps. So I did a lot of temp accounting. And then through a friend, I ended up working for Shelter Records, which is uh, Leon Russell's label. But back in those days, we were uh, distributed by Capitol Records and later MCA. And um, people like the Gap Band started with us and Phoebe Snow started with us. And so it was a, they had, they had really hit people. Uh, so I learned about promotion. I learned by working with the National Promotion Manager. I was only there less than two years, but I came in for uh, as the uh, receptionist. And three weeks later, I was assistant to the national <laughs> a promotional manager. And before I left, I was assistant general manager. Then I worked for Paramount for a while, Paramount Pictures uh, as an assistant to a writer. And I just did a little bit of some of his research for him and little things, not much. And that's when I really was able to get back into painting because he would tell me to go home and paint, you know? Uh, so there's like those angels that were around. And then during a period in the seventies for about five years, I also did acting. Um, the biggest thing for me was having a national McDonald's commercial, which allowed me to stay home for six months and paint. Uh, I worked for his Disney Studios. I mean, it's endless. Um, I learned uh, a little more about advertising because I worked for Southern Living Magazine for a time. Uh, I mean, how many is this like endless things that I've done? And then I had my own tax business for 10 years, uh, which I was able to be the tax person that people in entertainment and um, creative people could go to that understood what they did and figure out how to do that on paper to save them money. So through this, how did you, um, I mean, it, you, you moved along to pursue your purpose. And yeah. your purpose was what you wanted to do ever since you were five years old. Exactly. And, and, every, and every time I had a full-time job, I would get up, um, you know, especially not the record business because you're doing work at night, but I always set a time, a side time for painting 
So when I worked for Micro Z, which was a computer corporation, I was their accountant for their three offices. Um, I'd get up early in the morning and paint before I went to work. And then I'd paint all day Sunday, you know? So I was always doing what I feel I was, the creator put me here to do. My purpose and my, my passion. I was always doing that regardless of the other jobs. And do you have a studio at home or where do you do your work? Right at home. I live in an old Spanish duplex. I've been here, it's gone on 25 years. And right now I'm in that back bedroom, which is turned into where I paint. Um, this relatively small space is also where I designed 150 feet for Ontario International Airport that was fabricated into ceramic tile. Um, I designed stained glass windows in here for a library in Tampa, Florida. Everything in this space. And the, what's nice about this space is that there's a sun porch, so I can just open those shades and all I see is trees and, and foliage and whatever. So the space feels even bigger because of that. Okay, we're going to open it up now, but before we do, for everyone you know, to ask questions, I'm just curious, tips or advice you might have to crafters, artists, people who love it, but think, I can't make a living from this. I, uh, I, I, I'm not well known. I don't know about my, I get good feedback from my work. And there's actually a couple of people who sent text messages and said, would you please have Cynthia talk about that? If I love the art and I love... I love what I'm creating, but I'm afraid of doing whatever with it because the, I'm nobody knows me. What what advice or what would you say? Well, I would say that first of all, you've got to you have to go for it. Okay, uh, I feel like well, we all realize tomorrow's not promised. You're here and it's now. You've got to go for it. Some things take more time than others. But anyone would be very surprised at if, for instance, if you're if you're an artist, if you paint or you sculpt or whatever that that you do, you don't have to be in a traditional gallery. I've made more money outside of galleries than ever in a gallery. And you don't have to be in museums. You don't have anybody else to do that for you. You can have little shows in one of your community centers, your place of worship, whatever. I've always done little small salons, even in my little apartment years ago, and I just had a little tiny apartment where people actually came to you. And you start on a, a smaller scale. But nowadays, with the, the whole computer thing and the whole websites for free that you can actually do, you can actually do so much more without anybody else's help. So you can do it. You just have to, like like Dan Fisher, he took a leap of faith on me. So no, you gotta take a leap of faith on yourself. And it's just amazing how good you'll feel. Okay. Okay, as I said, we're gonna open it up now to the gallery view, but while we do, could you talk a little bit about how you name your paintings? Well, first, anything that I paint, okay, oftentimes I'm still commissioned because I've done, I think to date, about 17 paintings for various colleges and universities. So I'm really happy about that because that's part of my legacy. Um, five of the times, if not, not more than that, six of the times have been for inaugurations of new presidents and to the... Uh, college or university, but it's never a portrait of them. It's always some history of the school and, and my figurative and multicultural and f kind of work. Um, so that happens. And then there's, there's even art and embassies. I'm part of the art and embassies program. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyone that's interested in art or has art that w would like to promote it, look up art and embassies Anyone can participate. It's up to the ambassadors what work they would like in their different embassies. That's one of the reasons I'm anywhere in this, uh, around, more so around the world. 
And um, to my new friend in my Emerald something, and I'm getting ready to look up, I had work even uh, exhibited in Singapore, in an American embassy in Singapore. That's the closest I have physically got there, <laughs> which is not too bad, which is not too bad if at least your art can get there, you know? And I, I, I don't know, there's, what else, Joyce? Yeah, well, that was, well, I was asking about naming. Uh, oh, na oh, well, because I got inspired myself. I got so inspired, I forgot about that part. But everything I do, even when it's commissioned for colleges and universities, come from the art. And it's very important to me that um, when I'm not here and I'm somewhere else, or I've come back in another form or whatever, that no one will go to a museum and they'll see one of my paintings and it'll say untitled. Every single one of my paintings for me have to be titled. Um, so I, I, it comes from whatever that inspiration is. What inspired that painting or what is that painting saying? Or maybe it's just a kind of description of it, but what sounds nice? Um, yeah. Sometimes it might just be the name of that place, but it has a title. Yeah. When I was looking at, at your paintings uh, in your gallery, I mean, on, on your website, and also mm -hmm. when I was going through the J.C. Penny collection, I was taken with the names. And, uh, and I always wondered, does that come first? <laughs> is, is it a thought um, that comes in the process? Well, you know, once in a blue moon, it will come first. Um, generally in the process of painting. And sometimes when I'm just about completed, close to signing it, but, it, but it'll come from more of a meditative sense. It might be me on my walk when I'm doing my prayers and affirmations, which is generally around bodies of water. There's a couple of reservoirs near me. And for 18 years, I drove 45 minutes a day to the beach for sunrise and back and that's where I did my prayers and affirmations. And during periods like that, or maybe when I first wake up in the morning, those are the times when the, the title will come to me. Okay. All right, <laughs> everybody, we've got we've got a few minutes left. So we're gonna open it up and uh, boy, I wanna pull out a pen and or a, a brush and do something. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, it, do it. I'm gonna get my <laughs> sick men working. Hey, do it. I, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but someone told me about this really popular book that sold incredibly well, Stick Figures. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it was done a long time ago. Maybe now it's... No, 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 no. no. This was probably maybe five years ago. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Okay, anybody have any questions they want to ask Cynthia? Thelma Reese. Oh, oh, okay, Carol. Susie, you're on. Um, have you done any uh, paintings uh, recently um, depicting Black Lives Matter? Um, that, you know what? Let me think. Sometimes that comes up, meaning that in the sense that I've done so much work with historically Black colleges and universities, um, and one of my paintings probably six years ago uh, because of the unrest in Ferguson, because this, this particular university is in St. Louis. I had one of the young men students in the painting with a shirt on it said Black Lives Matter. Um, I created a paintings, I did actually I did six paintings for a mural for affordable living housing, 40 unit housing development is totally new, probably unveiled the uh, piece I did that actually muralists uh, replicated from my work to be four stories high. And there's a couple of the, the, the people in there that have something on to that effect, all lives matter, or you know some kind of significance, Black Lives Matter, and whatever uh, mm -hmm. is in that mural as well. Yeah, and then I've done so much on historic people uh, to an extent. Um, 
that that's sort of an affirmation or that but also the unity sense i've, I've done work one is called brand new day um that i could actually walk in the other room and bring here and show it to you real quick if you like sure okay <laughs> we'd love to see it well she's getting it thelma you have a question yeah i i did want to uh <clears throat> Yes. Yeah. Comment that I was very interested in Cynthia's work uh, with children's illustrations and, uh, and and what what happens with the illustrator and the writer and the fact that when you're working with books for young children, can you see that? Yes. Yeah. But Thelma, hold that, and what that's a really good part. Let Cynthia. Know. Yeah, let me know. You're on. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I know there's too much light, but let me see. If I move this, there's a little bit too much light, but what you can see is that this one's more about unity. Yes. It's more about my aftermath or what I want to say is has to do with unity. So this one is called Brand New Day. And if you look at the sky, you can tell that that's a celebration. Yes. Yeah, so. Wonderful. So that is actually one of my pieces that really talk to uh, Black Lives Matter and unity. That's wonderful. That's one of my, what's one of my, main, that's one of my main themes in a lot of my work. It's really more about the unification of people. That's perfect. And yeah. now, Thelma, we're going to switch gears. Yeah. Great question. Uh, I, uh, I'm so interested in what you said about writing, uh, painting for illustrating children's books. And the fact that there's, you are as much the author when you do that as the yes. person who writes the words. And I wanted to know if you were familiar with Ashley Bryan's work as a great writer of children's literature and painter. He's now oh, I, seven. Ashley Bryant? Ashley Bryan. He he Bryant. Okay, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look I'm gonna look him up because I'm not. Well he probably was the first well known black writer and illustrator of children's books. He's okay. 97 and he has a book out that came out just two years ago. He's a very great man. He did go through art schools actually and mm -hmm. also through Columbia University for philosophy, but he was also an artist as a kid and he was seen. And when he tried to get into the Cooper Union he was a New Yorker uh -huh. and his teachers had recommended that he go there. Uh, no one of color had ever been admitted, but that was the only art school that did a blind admissions test. So they only looked at the uh, applicant's work and right. didn't see the person. So of course he was admitted. <laughs> He later was a great <laughs> art professor at Dartmouth, among other universities. But he's 97. And now, still you was, said he also was with Dartmouth? He taught, he taught art at Dartmouth, among oh, other places. Oh, wow. I had a chance to, to a short artist in residency just a couple of days at Dartmouth um, he's, some he's years a, back. He's a truly great man, and you would love him. <laughs> OK, well, I'm, well, I'm, de I'm definitely. Her. I'm definitely looking it up. You guys are giving me homework. As soon as I get up, I have stuff to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a small world because he's lovely. And there's a there's a little um, uh, interview with him in my latest book, "How Seniors Are Saving America." And Ashley is in there. And I met him two years ago when he came from his little island in Maine down to the University of Pennsylvania. He's an amazing person. Are you in Pennsylvania? I'm in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Uh, I've, I've, I've worked with Cheney University there. Oh, great. Yeah, and Morgan State. 
um, just for artists and authors day one time. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've gotten around. I'm, I'm, I amaze myself how much I've gotten around. But, <laughs> but someone said that I know it was Vicky. Vicky, w- once I realized that I could and I did enjoy working with universities and speaking to students, I literally sent out letters and emails and packages to universities all over the place. And that's one of the reasons why I've got so many responses. Uh, and, um, and that's also, how I really, you know. Uh, you're also among the few, the few artists. My husband is an artist and he's worked with a lot of artists, but you're one of the few who understands so much about business that well, that's because I come from that ba- I come from that background, right? That's my background in my being absolutely. an accountant. And, it's such a yeah, and I even worked with lawyers for a while too. Such such a wonderful combination, and yeah. so rare. I know, I'm kind of like left, right, left, right. <laughs> 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 but it balances out. So sometimes the left side of my brain talks to the right side yeah. of my brain. And says, yeah. "Now, Cynthia, I think you better take care of this business this morning first. Yeah. You know, we're operating on all cylinders." Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's there's right. one other thing. There's one other thing I wanted to tell you that I know I, I mentioned it to Joyce and Vicky. Oh, um, <clears throat> via email is that through this whole uh, the wake of the pandemic, I started a whole series on healers, orishas, shamans, and deities, and um, that was my way of hopefully helping other people, you know, to to uplift other people, and it certainly has been uplifting for me. So just at uh, I believe in November, I put out this little book. Can you see that? Yep. yep. Okay. And it's called, it's called the heal, it's actually called Healers of Research Shamans and Deities and the Healing Art of Cynthia St. James. Um, and how I got to recognize the healing uh, quality. It was in probably 1991 when one of my friend's grandchild had Down syndrome and she told me that in her house when he would ever be over, if he was in a room where my paintings were, he didn't cry. And that was the only place that he didn't cry. And that told me a lot. So since then, I've had a lot of art and have done commissions for hospitals, but there's a lot of different hospitals that, um, have some of my work maybe in the waiting room or maybe in the office. Um, And it it seems to have a a calming healing effect. So that's the reason why I put out this little book. And it has 12 of my paintings in there. And what's happened with most people is that they end up buying two because they end up taking the big size paintings and framing them. (laughs) And then they keep one just to have a copy of the book. And I said, that's fine with me. But if it's if it's helping in any kind of healing, that's what I wanted to do. Beautiful. Yeah. Didn't, didn't you do something, a, a piece of art, um, uh, with for Kamala Harris? I did a piece on her. Oh, you did. And it's, yeah, it's called Kamala Protectress of the People, and um, and what I was doing in that painting, I was showing the combination of the heritages. So she's dressed in a sari, but then you find a, a in her this oh god, I'm just thinking about it. You see the African influence, you see in her headdress, you see her Jamaican influence, her traditional Jamaican head wrap. Um, and in her torch, you see some of the some of her background as well. Um, and when I later looked up her name and the, her completely. Um, she ended up in my uh, healers and uh, rishas and goddess series. First, her first name and middle name are both names of goddesses, Hindu goddesses. Hmm. And Kamala, uh, uh, actually one of the deities, was the protector of the villages. Hmm. So it's just amazing 
that I came up with that title, Kamala, Protectress of the People, and that's what her name means. Cynthia, share <laughs> with the group what's embedded in the Kamala painting. Um, what's embedded in there is her, her, all her heritages, as well as a little bit of her background. Um, in the torch, uh, the colors of her university, Howard University, in her sorority, AKA, there's the, their colors, the pink and the, and the lime green in the segment of that torch, because that's part of who she is. I thought that was such a beautiful expression of uh... And when, when I saw it and I, and then when you explained it, I thought, oh, what, what, a, what a wonderful way to encapsulate them all in the painting. And, and, that, and what I love about that too, Joyce, is that I'm always uh, creating some kind of challenge, creative challenge for myself to figure it out, how to, how to do something. And then at the end, I'm amazed that I was able to do it. I still have that um, sense of, um, Amazement. How do we, in closing, because we want to be be honest to our hour, the books. How how can we how how do we purchase or where, where do we find the books? Well, the easiest way. I have a whole book thing, Amazon.com. I mean, I'm on there as an author, so I have a lot of books. I my from everything from my poetry, my cookbook, my. <laughs> Business books, everything is there. That's the easiest. Wait a minute. We never went to the cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, of course, that's it's a cookbook too. As you, you almost, and you almost like you say, what haven't you done? <laughs> There's things I haven't done. I mean, I, I have had uh, nightmares where I was standing in front of a group of people because I was I was a singer, but I could, but then I realized I couldn't sing. <laughs> Laryngitis again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So there are things. There's quite a, a lot of things I haven't done, but I come from a big family, and I was I always cooked, and I always enjoyed cooking. Nowadays, I don't cook so much because I'd rather paint. <laughs> I mean, because you know. Cooking is creative. Yes. It's very creative. So I'm, you know, doing being Julia Child for a while, you know. But basically, um, I can't do all that. That takes too much time. I want to devote as much time in these years to the painting as much as possible. So Cynthia, as we kind of try to bring this to a close, you've done so many things. What? Kind of what three things would you suggest to uh, individuals who are kind of uh, trying to pursue what's next in their life or what their purpose is? How do you, how does one go about, what advice would you give, three tips about pursuing your passion and purpose to fulfill your happiness? I, I would say, first of all, get to the quiet space, a calmness, not a plan thing maybe wherever is a the happy place for you or a nice place for you is if it's in nature if you like to around be around animals people the beach whatever feels good the mountains you know if you want to actually go outside of your home to do it and just kind of relax don't call yourself meditating but relax and just listen to that inner voice because the inner voice knows you know, uh, the inner voice gets drowned out as we get older because we forgot, you know, we forget what we, the things that made us most happy. Or think about, yeah, that's another, that's another thing. Think about the things that make you most happy and what could you do that could be some of those things. And then go for it. My, my, one of my mom's things uh, that she used to like to say, nothing beats a failure but a try. Um, great, great words. <laughs> Simple great. and great, right? Nothing beats a failure but a try. But look. a try. Yeah. Are you writing this down? I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and yet again. 
nothing beats a failure but a try. Great advice. Yeah. And on that note, uh, unless anybody wants the last word. By the way, welcome, Helen. <laughs> Cynthia, you're <laughs> a neighbor. So uh, Helen Dennis is, uh, where well, you're in Redondo Beach, right? I'm in Redondo Beach. Yeah, so. Okay. So but I'm not, you're not, you're not too far. I'm, I'm right, in, I'm right on Los Feliz Boulevard, but I love the beach. So the closest I generally get to you on my walks is uh, about close to Marina Del Rey. So I, I'm sorry to be late, but Cynthia, your three tips has made the entire piece for me. Thank you. Those tips were beautiful. Oh, really? Okay, great, great. I'm glad I included my mom's. That was pretty cool. Her other thing she used to say to all her kids is keep on pushing. <laughs> <laughs> but but that one, nothing beats a failure but a try. It's very strong. Yep. You I, definitely yeah. have energized us for this this hour. It's um just to think about all you have accomplished. Try you know, and accomplish. Really? Because you know, it kind of wears me out because I don't even think about it because I'm already <laughs> on to what can I do now and tomorrow? You know, so so when I say all this stuff, I get <laughs> too much energy. Straight <laughs> to the kitchen for some Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> and where am I looking? Emerald? Emerald Hill. Okay, got H -I -L -L, it. H-I-L-L, Emerald Hill. I bet you I'm going to have some work coming from that next. <laughs> yeah, it's a, thank you for that. Thank you for yes. that. Okay, Joyce, you want to kind of wrap it up and say what's yeah. next? Yeah, Cynthia, we can't thank you enough. This has been wonderful. And uh, so we're going to wind down on this. Uh, we did put over in the chat box, so you all have uh, is Cynthia's email. And as she said, on Amazon is where you can get the book. And she said you can go right to website, which is right over in that chat box. Uh, so if you want to check out the, the actual artwork, uh, it, it's it's all there. Joyce, um, you know, there's something else, Joyce. You yeah. know what? Um, remember I, the Women's History Month. Did you put that, that that coupon code? Did anybody see anything they would like? That's right. In that first message, but uh, I'll, we'll include it and make sure everyone has that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, put Women's History, you know, W-H-M. Woman Herstory Month. And, um, you know, just that 25 in case anybody wants to do that. That's not anything anybody has to do, but so they know that they do at least have a discount. Okay, and we have a list of everyone's name who's here. So we'll send a follow-up email and, and make sure all this information is, is will be delivered to everybody. Okay. All righty. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to just share a little bit about next week. Your passion for what you do, your drive, your business savvy. You are the total woman. <laughs> you are a renaissance woman. <laughs> Meanwhile, my stick men look pretty, pretty pathetic. <laughs> well, you know what? Just add a little color. Just do some color markers. Yeah. And you'll have a beautiful abstract. Isn't it interesting that um, adult coloring books came out? It was uh, it was okay for adults to color. Yeah. Yes. They were given permission. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's really great. Yep. And whoever decided to do that, making some good money. Yep. They're on some <laughs> island somewhere, sipping Mai Tais. Yes. <laughs> Joyce? Okay. Thank okay. You. And so I'm gonna, am I leaving you ladies anything else you need from me? Um, I think we are we are complete. Uh, Vicki, yeah. you want to just share a little bit about next week and uh, and then let's let's wind up. Okay. Although we always say we're we always hang out at the bar afterwards. so if anybody wants to you know share any conversation, uh, feel free to stay. Okay, well, I'm gonna say, Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity and the privilege. It was a delight. And I am going to leave, and I'm going downstairs and getting a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. We may all do it in your honor as well. Okay. <laughs> I have thank you, ladies. Hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Bye-bye. Yeah.